What's going on everyone? Nick from Comic Culture here. It's time for Nick at Night, my weekly comic book review show. And you know the sponsor of this video is JW Storytelling's Kickstarter. Let's check it out now. Hey everyone, Nick here. Wanted to show you real quick the Legend of Kaiden prologue from friend of the show, Jesse Wolf. He's got a Kickstarter going on from now until July 5th. And I wanted to show you guys some of the cool stuff they're doing over there, featuring a 24 page standard size comic book about a kingdom under siege. We got this amazing cover A. We have a cool hero villain spot light over on the cover B and then all those guys that love those villain shots we also have a cardstock cover C available as well but guys go down below like I said I'll have a link down here to the Kickstarter campaign you can check out some of the interior art read the synopsis seems like it's gonna be a really cool story I'm excited for backing this one and support our team Jesse Noah and Camillo but guys thanks so much good luck with your campaign and keep making awesome comics all right, let's get into the books this week. So as you know, I'm gonna go ahead and put my grading scale up and I'm gonna put the cover of that book on the grading scale so you can see how they all stack up against each other. So let's get into the big two as we always do. We have plenty to go through. We have The Avengers, issue number two from Jeb McKay, a series that I was really interested in. I couldn't wait to jump on here and see exactly where it goes. Jeb McKay is a great writer. I've been reading his Moon Knight run since the very first issue, and I've been loving that one. A little directionalist, um, but uh, it, it's okay. So I'm excited to get into here and see what's going on. And this book has been really intriguing so far. I'm really anxious to see where it goes. It's setting up a lot of cool things. We have our new Avengers team. I gave it a little bit of slack in the first issue um, because I was like, well... It's not really an imaginative team. Like, we're putting the Avengers back together. Who do you think would be on the team? And that's essentially who is on here. But we had a really cool uh, collaboration moment with all the new members trying to take on this, essentially, this, like, black hole kind of event that was spinning off. There was this gigantic uh, being they were taking out. And, of course, everybody ch uh, chipped in to do that. But at the end of this, Carol Danvers actually was confronted by a very well-known, very powerful villain anti-hero whatever it might be and he's got a very specific warning for captain marvel and there's kind of like this ultimatum that uh if you help me do this one thing i'm going to give you some knowledge about how you can save a lot of people in the next few days and so how can she not uh, uh accept this bribe in a way but um i would say getting into this issue you kind of have to have read timeless issue number two i believe featuring Kang just to kind of get all the different pieces of this. The art's really cool in here. The story was intriguing and I was like speed reading through it because I was just eating it up, man. Jeb McKay's writing style is really awesome. I like where it's going. I can't wait to see where it goes from here. Really cool book. I'm, I'm glad I'm enjoying an Avengers book, honestly. And so, yeah, we're going to see where it goes, man. We're going to see. I, I've, I've been digging it. Check this one out. What'd you guys think? Going over to Miles Morales Spider-Man. Holy cow, Ziggler's on this one. The art is incredible as well. I've been absolutely loving Miles Morales. I'm so glad uh, that I'm digging a spider book and Miles is right there. I've been reading this one from the beginning as well. We have Vincentini on the art doing some just crazy, crazy things. Trying to show you like a little splash page. He does stuff like this. This is absolutely incredible. You can sit here for a few minutes just kind of staring at the webbing, staring at the composition, staring at the battle scenes. It's just incredible what he's able to do inside of this book. And the art alone would be like a reason to read this book. But the writing is actually really interesting as well really in the tone of Miles Morales, which I like. It's got that like fun flavor to it. And you know, it's a little bit different than Peter Parker, although they have similar personalities in a way. You know, they got like that youthful energy to them where they're kind of like making jokes, making quips. They're not quite, they're never in the position where they feel overly confident in a lot of things until they're pushed too far. That's exactly where we are here. We got this gigantic carnage crossover event going on right now. And we have a lot of other uh, heroes and villains teaming up to take on this threat and we have a Miles Morales upgrade uh, suit upgrade towards the end nothing we really haven't seen before but maybe new to this character so if you're not really enjoying the spider books that are out right now you got to check out Miles Morales definitely worth it the Hulk issue number one or the Incredible Hulk rather issue number one from Philip Kennedy Johnson we have Nick Klein on the art as well, which really got my attention because I like Nick Klein's work over on Thor with Donnie Cates. Some incredible stuff going on inside of here. Takes a little bit from past Hulk runs, talking about like the green door, talking about like the mythology around the Hulk uh, as a monster, as a beast, as an entity, an avatar, something like that, right? Uh, taking a lot of those liberties from past runs, kind of bring it into here. If you didn't read some of the past runs though, like the L Ewing and some of the Donnie stuff, you're not going to be completely lost. It's a pretty generic opening 
to uh, a Hulk run in general. We basically have our classic like miscommunication between Bruce Banner and the Hulk. The Hulk really wants out because of the way it was treated psychologically by Bruce Banner in the previous Donnie run. And so uh, Bruce is actually kind of on the run from the Hulk in a way, and he's trying to manifest himself, trying to be the permanent being, the permanent form from those two. Now we have some ancient monsters that were recently found on Earth and they're unleashed. They know about this green door and the Hulk mythology, things like that. So it's actually going out to uh, take over the Hulk, I'm uh, assumingly to take over its power, something like that. And so we get a lot of cool things happening inside of here. We get some familiar other hero faces in here. We get a lot of new villains we've never seen before. And so we're going to see where it goes. Art-wise, it's incredible story. So far, it's kind of generic. We'll see where it goes, though. I'm excited. How about you guys? Next Marvel book we have was Secret Invasion. We have issue number one from Jonathan Hickman, and we have Brian Hitch on here. I got this amazing Miles Morales variant right here, this negative space variant. As soon as I got it, I threw it in the bag and board, and I just did not want to disturb it. I gave it like the white glove treatment while reading it because it's just like a beautiful cover. Now, was the story any good? Um, you have to have a lot of understanding, I would say, of like the maker. It really helps if you have some other ultimate universe knowledge about like the maker and who he is is and what the goals are and what happened to the other people from this universe. I have a base understanding of what's going on. And then it also helps to have read some of Donny Cates' Venom run because you get a lot of the maker in there and you get to see, I think the last time we saw him was around issue 25, 26 of Venom. And so it kind of helps to see where he left off in there. But then I was a little bit confused about how we got to where we are in this issue. So like maybe I missed some essential reading to bridge that gap. But I will say it has that Hickman feel to it, but it feels a little more simple than what we're used to seeing from Hickman. And so we're going to see if that is going to get more complex as this universe kind of opens back up. I will say that the maker is in here and he makes his presence felt pretty quickly in a real dramatic way. And so that's really cool. We have a lot of other heroes engaged. Brian Hitch is on the art, of course, and it's okay. There's moments where it really works, I think. And there's moments where it feels a little bit too much like some of his other recent work over on Venom in particular. And I don't exactly like that art style, but again, some panels that work, some panels that doesn't. But I got to say overall, the, the issue seems a little bit simplistic, but I'm excited at least to see where it goes from there. We do get a little Miles collaboration a little bit in there but he's not exactly in all the panels or throughout the entire book. He's just focused on a few pages. And I thought that little moment they had together was actually kind of interesting. So uh, I'm anxious to see where it goes from here. Issue number two should be next month. And so did you guys read it? And what'd you guys think? Going over to DC Comics, we have Joshua Williamson on Superman. We have issue number five. I've actually been digging this run a whole lot. This issue in particular was really something special. We've been talking about the art. The art's been absolutely spectacular in all of these issues. In this one here, we had some backstory on Jimmy Olsen. We actually have his relationship explained to us with uh, Silver Banshee. And so it's been pretty cool to see like how they got together and their, the, how that relationship has flourished because it threw a lot of us off, including myself, uh, when it was revealed that they were actually a couple. Now she's attacking Superman. Like what's going on? Why is this a thing? Well, we understand a little bit more about the possession that she was under by the people that are kind of at the root of all this destruction and chaos that's been going on in Metropolis right now course the other part of this whole thing is the Lex Luthor Superman relationship they have this communication methodology between the two of them Lex is locked up in a prison right now he's not really in a great spot towards the end of this issue so it's going to be interesting to see how he bounces back if he can bounce back from that Superman's enjoying some much needed downtime because of the result of the battle between him and Silver Banshee so that was a really cool interesting thing and I like the way that that story kind of played out I thought it was a real creative way to Kind of like depower Superman, but at what cost kind of a thing. So I'm going to be anxious to see how Superman 6 ends up. How do we get Lex Luthor out of this predicament that he's in? And what does it mean for Superman to maybe potentially lose this partner of his in whatever relationship they were fostering this entire time? So Superman has been doing a really good job of keeping my interest. The art's really spectacular as well. The storytelling is interesting. And I'm anxious to read issue number six, which is all you can ask for. But let me know if you guys are reading Superman down below. Going over to DC, we have the Vigil issue number two from Ram V. I loved this one. Issue number one was pretty good. Uh, I don't really know much about the Vigil, new team and everything like that. Featured in the backstory of a couple DC books over the last few months. But like, what was this going to be like uh, once it's got its own series? And we have been introduced to this new character called Arclight. At least it's new to me. Anyways, first, first off, amazing cover on here featuring our character in this issue. But Arclight is a really cool character. Essentially, 
power sets, you know, around electricity, something like that. But it also has like the ability to like redirect energy or something like that. And we're going to explore that a little bit inside of this issue. Arclight is actually sent on this mission. He's somebody who just never fails in his mission, something like that. He's sent on this mission right now to to do some like search and recovery, basically. This like mysterious thing that's being held in this bunker. We get to see exactly what it is. It's actually the kid from Saga. So that was pretty cool. Nice little, <laughs> nice little thing right there. No spoilers or anything, but this kid's gonna be pretty interesting. And his power set is showed off throughout this issue. And it's an interesting way, uh, in, in an interesting way that like Ark like has to think on his feet as to how to neutralize this kid because his powers are interesting and the reason this kid exists is because of some government agency uh, experimental program that they were putting out and so this kid was the result of that and so uh, I'm not going to show you or explain much more about that but these two people are going to be really cool going down in the future and uh, the team that they're on is pretty cutthroat so it's almost like a suicide squad kind of a thing they have their own version of like their Amanda Waller that's barely focus on the objective and like any means necessary kind of a thing. And I really like the art in here too. The ending really confused me. We're going to see where that goes, but like the vigil issue number two, loved it way more than issue number one, really cool book, great art, interesting story, very, very cool characters that you actually care about. And Ron B does a really good job, great, really great job of that. Check out vigil issue number two. Wonder Woman issue number 800. So I will say that I have not been reading Wonder Woman as of late. I do some spot checks, some pulse checks every once in a while. I did read Yara Flora, uh, her entire run, even though it was just a few, a few issues long. Um, if you have not been reading Wonder Woman, you can essentially skip the first... I don't know, two thirds of this book, to be honest with you, because it all has to do with Wonder Woman going through this like psychological journey or whatever it is, metaphysical journey, trying to figure out uh, the relationship she has with her different members of the Trinity, things like that. She's in Themyscira right now, surrounded by her loved ones, going through all these different visions. Now, the artwork is beautiful in here, but the story is very, um, I'm not going to say like generic, but it's like at the end of the day, who cares kind of a thing, you know, because it's it's kind of wrapping up where we were, I guess, uh, with the Wonder Woman. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. What I was really interested in was the preview for um, Tom King's version of Trinity. And so Trinity is our main character right here, the daughter of Wonder Woman. And so Trinity here has a couple different meanings because we get to see the new updated Trinity inside of here and we get to go on their first mission basically together and they each have a role to play. Now, I will say that since this is written by Tom King, a lot of you are probably going to be like, no, I'm not going to read this one. Or you want to know if it has the same kind of Tom King tropes as some of his other books do. I will say in this preview so far, there's no sign of time jumpy, weird dialogue, we're going to explain this part of the story first and that part of the story, or we're going to hide all this stuff or shroud everything in, in weird, complicated fashions. It's none of that. It's very straightforward. It's to the point, just cool character moments, really interesting art as well. Like I said, this new Trinity here each has a role to play, and we explore that some more. It does have a merely mysterious ending, I would say, because I didn't exactly know everything that was going on towards the end. But we're going to see more about this as this stuff comes out from Tom King. So it's got me interested for sure. Check this one out. World's Finest, issue number 16 from Wade Mora and Bond Villain. Again, if you want that classic Batman Superman book vibe with modern art and modern writing, man, this is definitely the book for you. Insane color, insane artwork. This is just an incredible read, very visualistic. And the story is um, not exactly new reader friendly. I find myself going like, who is that again? Like, what's this name? Who is that? But if you're a long ter term, uh, DC reader and you know a lot about these obscure villains and things like that, then I think you're going to be fine, right? This is just something that I'm, I'm just having to deal with at the moment. And so, but I'm having a great time reading this book and just seeing all these different character moments and these different situations that our heroes find themselves in. We basically have somebody taking over all the most powerful robotics engineer villain minds, and he's uh, pooling a lot of the resources to create this advanced AI, and it's basically trying to take over the world right now, and we have all these different characters getting together trying to save the day because, of course, this villain goes after our world's finest team here first to incapacitate them to help uh, you know, promote their stuff. So. Really cool book, insane art, insane coloring. Um, again, I think it helps if you have a uh, kind of a knowledge of some deep cut DC villains, things like that, but you don't have to. And uh, this is just a really cool, really cool, exciting, action-packed, non-stop, fast-paced read. Got to be checking this one out too. 
Next book we're going to get into this week is I Hate Fairyland issue number six from Scotty Young. Now, this is a series, again, I still haven't read volume number one. I need to get into it because now we're touching base with things that happened inside of volume one. Although I'm not exactly lost, right? We still have Gertrude in here. She's wrecking scene right now. She went down there for a very specific reason. She was actually hired by this super powerful, like maniac kind of a guy to retrieve her son. But things happened, things changed. The son was never there or something like that, or he got home just fine. And so she's kind of defaulted to the real reason why she was there, which was basically destroy, take over uh, Fairyland. So this guy can essentially build a theme park down there, something like that. So he can make a lot of money, whatever it is. She's actually on this mission right now to try to get the hell out of there. She's running into a lot of characters that she must have run into in the volume one. And the new ruler, the new ownership of Fairyland is not exactly happy that she's down there and is actually sending some very interesting interesting assassins to go take her out. So uh, I like the way that the story is progressing right now. It's really fun. It's extremely colorful, extremely animated. You don't have to have read volume one, but I, it for sure would help, I would say. I don't think I've ever read a book that has like this level of not humor, but I would say charm and just fun and levity to it. It's a very, very interesting book. I highly recommend checking it out for sure. I hate Fairyland issue number six. Let me know if you guys are reading it. Keeping the image train going, we have Saga issue number 65 from Fiona Staples and Brian K. Vaughn. This was a great, great issue. This issue felt a little bit more like the saga that I'm used to, to be honest with you. Some of the newer issues that have come out since 55, are we 10 issues in already to the saga re-releasing? This is incredible. Some of those have felt a little bit off brand in a way, um, at least from a storytelling or just vibe perspective. It's really hard to, to, uh, to describe that feeling right here. But this issue seems to rein it back in a little bit. We had a couple different stories going on at once. We had some classic characters coming back into the fold and fighting each other. And it was really, really cool. I like the way that he tells stories because basically we have two or three different stories happening at once. So one page is dedicated to that story. The other page is dedicated to that. And they both have this like amping up effect. Like neither of the stories feels like it's stagnant or it's just kind of dragging on. They're both uh, amping up at the exact same time. So you're like, yeah, and you're kind of flipping the page. You're like, okay, I'm caught up there and I jump over here. I can't believe that's happening. And then you turn the page and the same thing. It's just this really cool, interesting bounce back and forth thing that they got going on. Um, in classic saga fashion, there's a lot of things going on that give you that WTF moment. Lots of high stakes. We're learning a lot of cool stuff. A lot of characters that we've known and loved and then hated and then loved again and then hated again are popping in and out of this book and doing some pretty crazy things. So we're going to see if our heroes can finally rest for a little while because they've been on the run and we can see if some of our anti-heroes and villains can recover from this tragic event that's happening right now in here. Uh, very emotionally impactful, I would say. Not like tear jerking, but like, oh no, I can't believe this is happening kind of a thing. It really reminds me of Game of Thrones. You just kind of fall in love with characters and then some kind of tragic event happens. And uh, that's exactly what we get inside of here. Fiona Staples' art is absolutely incredible. It feels very different than it did when she was originally putting out these books, but like it's still just absolutely beautiful. There's a glowing and like radiance about it that I've noticed in the last uh, ten issues that just didn't didn't really exist in the in the uh, first you know fifty five issues. Definitely inside of here, very very cool book. One of my favorite reads of all time. You got to be on Saga. Check this one out. All right, and the last book we read this week was Tenement, issue number one from Lemire, Sorrentino, and Dave Stewart. This is a continuation of that Bone Orchard mythos universe that they're setting up right now. Not exactly connected, as far as I can tell, to any of the other stories that have come out. So if you haven't read those, you can probably jump in here and you'll be just fine. Andrea Sorrentino and Dave Stewart, amazing, amazing artwork and coloring and lettering and everything like that. So those guys are absolutely killing it, as they always do. This story is definitely in the same vibe as the other stories in the Bone Orchard mythos. We basically have a whole new set of characters. They're all interconnected in this really weird way that they don't quite understand just yet that we explore a little bit further in the issue. There's of course some kind of like supernatural element. Is it a haunting? Is it a presence? Is it a alternate universe? Is it fate? Is it karma? Who knows, right? It's existing. There's some kind of layer of some kind of evilness that is layered on top of these people's lives that are all interconnected. And we're going to see some tragedies and we're going to have a lot of 
just like unusual things happening that we really can't explain, but they're demonic in nature. And so we're going to explore what this is in further issues, I would imagine, in classic style from these folks. Um, really interesting cliffhanger at the end too, I would say, like something you could never have predicted and who knows where it's going to go from there. So if you're into the Bone Orchard Mythos, 10,000 Black Feathers, you like books like this, I think you're really going to enjoy Tenement number one. This one was actually better than I thought it was going to be because I'm coming off of this like depressed kind of a mode after reading those first two installments. We got this one right here. It was actually really good. What'd you guys think? Let me know. But guys, that's everything I read this week. I hope you enjoyed that. Go down below in the comments. Let me know what you read and what your favorite books of the week were. And don't forget to check out JW Storytelling's Kickstarter. I'll have links down below in the description as well. That's good until July 5th, so be sure to check it out. But as always, I appreciate you watching the video. Like, subscribe, share, hit that bell notification to be alerted whenever I put out a new video. Thanks you very much for watching. See you down below in the comments.